Hey, Philip Selico, are you there? I think so. Oh, there Can you, you are. This is Jeff Gedman. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Uh, thank you for making time. It's a, a pleasure and privilege for us to have you with you, with us, you with us. Um, so we, we have a, a fabulous group. And so here is my proposal. Uh, colleague, associate publisher, Danielle, will read the list, just the names. And then I'll introduce you, you who needs no introduction. Then we'll hear from you on a couple of those topics you and I talked about. And then we'll open it up to uh, comments and Q&A. Does that suit? Yes, that would be fine. Brilliant. And my proposal, you all, is to be mindful of Philip and everybody's time uh, that we'll have a, uh, a stop at 11.45. Can you do that, Philip, till 11.45? Yes. Perfect. Um, great. So, Danielle, uh, tell us who is on this platform. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, today we have the TAI team, Charles Davidson, Jeff Gedman, Demir Marusic, Dan Canelli, Sean Keeley, Aaron Sibarium, and, of course, me. Um, then we have Craig Kennedy, uh, Carla Ann Robbins, David Kramer, Gabe Schoenfeld, Tom Melia, Giselle Donnelly, Nicole Penn, Peter Rao, Phil Wallach, Mark Lagon, Rashida Tawari, Rich Kramer, Mike Fox, Walt Hudson, Truman Anderson, Martin Skold, Christopher Harrison, and Arch Punnington. Thank you all for being here today. Hey, thank you, Danielle. And with um, uh, Philip Zellico's permission, we're going to record this. Uh, we're going to endeavor to share it with a larger audience. Uh, with that in mind, when you ask a question or make a comment, please identify yourself and your affiliation, and that will be helpful to everybody now and later. Philip, you and I talked about two things. Um, one, a paper you have written and I shared with the group on how to restore competence to government and public policy, a problem in your view that has been long in coming. And second, we talked a little bit about uh, what a post-pandemic post-mortem is gonna look like or what it should look like. You were executive director, I think it's right, of the 9-11 uh, Commission and you thought about these things carefully and uh, have considerable experience. I'm not reading your bio. Everybody knows you served in government at a high level. Everybody knows that you write books and articles, even for TAI, I might add, and everybody knows you're an academic. So, so illustrious career, and we're just eager to hear from you on those two matters or anything else on your mind, and then we're going to pepper you with questions. So thank you. Yeah, th uh, and thank you for hosting me uh, on uh, the American Interest um, viral video channel. The, uh, the article you referred to was published in the Texas National Security Review last year. Um, and it reflects a longstanding preoccupation I've had and actually a, a number of colleagues who've served in both academia and government. It's our impression and my very strong impression that the quality of American policy work has been going down steadily for a generation. Uh, an easy way, by the way, to understand this, and because we're in the midst of this current crisis and it's quite evident, is to contrast the reputation that the United States had in the world in the mid-20th century with its reputation for policy work today. Um, in the mid-20th century, the United States was regarded as the most competent government in the world. Period. Full stop. Um, people were in awe at the wondrous things the American government seemed to be able to pull off in almost every field of public problem solving. They were in awe of uh, aspects of the Roosevelt New Deal. They were in awe at the American production miracles during the war, in awe at the orchestration of the vast amphibious assaults and coordination of global supplies, in awe of things like the Berlin Airlift or the Marshall Plan, in awe of the creation of an atomic bomb um, and this enormous science program, or even things like the creation of the National Science Foundation after the war. I could just go on and on like this. There were so many examples. And in this reputation, 
Americans just by both large and small had the reputation of being sort of a can-do country. Uh, even uh, American kids were notorious for their ability to fix cars, fix broken down Jeeps. Um, we had a level of, uh, of high, we had the best high school uh, secondary education program of any developed country in the world at that time. By the way, something else we had also created um, with American government. And the Americans were regarded as relatively practical, pragmatic, non-ideological problem solvers par excellence. That was our reputation. You could contrast that, say, with the reputation of Chinese governance in the mid 20th century, which perhaps is best ca uh, captured by the uh, metaphor I remember from my childhood, slightly racist metaphor of a Chinese fire drill, a uh, noisy, cacophonous, and aimless. Uh, now think about those contrasting reputations in the mid 20th century. And now think about the contrasting reputations today. Something's happened. So part of a lot of what my essay was about was to explore well, what really has happened to the wondrous American reputation for the quality of its policy work, which I think has been getting steadily worse for something like 30 years. So it's, a, it's not a partisan observation. It's also not an observation directly linked to the uh, general assaults on government or criticisms of Washington. Uh, by the way, criticisms of Washington are not a new feature of American history. Criticism of Washington and, and Washington elites is as old as the Republic. And it's been a, it was a constant trope, by the way, in the 1950s and 1960s, when at the same time, 75% of Americans were saying they trusted the federal government to do the right thing most of the time. By the way, that those relevant percentages, which were steadily in the 60s and 70s, are now in the teens. Um, but that's a, been a, a generational trend that goes back to things in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So the, the issue that I was focusing on is why? What, what, what happened? So one interesting observation that I offer in the article is that this great American ability in problem solving did not come out of the academy and the gifts that we had in the mid 20th century never went back to the academy. So you have to have a hypothesis of why, why was it we were so good back then. And I make an argument having to do with the problem solving cultures, by the way, that were also a prominent feature of American business in the mid 20th century. Remember the, the reigning paradigm of American business in the mid 20th century was of the superb problem solvers run by executives who'd come off the shop floor and who were themselves master tinkerers and engineers and in which production and the ability to make things was the definition of the uh, paradigmatic American corporate executive, like the head of General Motors or, or many other examples one could give. So both in business and in government, the paradigmatic culture was of the practical problem solving engineer. By the way, accompanied by a culture of meticulous staff work, written staff work, by the way, with all kinds of estimates and detailed analyses and operational guidance and memoranda of everything that had happened at every meeting, a culture that was so strong that during the Eisenhower administration, when President Eisenhower would meet with John Foster Dulles one on one, both of them would routinely produce memcons of what had been said in their conversation. But, and they did that just that was a cultural habit. That was sort of what they were used to as what you did in government as good government. Of course, all this culture has entirely disappeared now, along with much else. So it didn't come out of the academy and it didn't go back into the academy. Instead, the academy mainly focused on uh, things like social science, economic, the fashions of economics and the rest. And the result is actually that most people who now do policy work in the government are simply entirely untrained in how to do policy work. 
the assumption that uh, I know how to do policy work because I've taken political science classes is like the assumption that if I've taken laboratory chemistry, I'm qualified to be a chemical engineer. And anyone who is, <laughs> knows anything about engineering knows how ludicrous that is. And of course, but we, in effect, we have no engineering training. Yet we expect people to do engineering work all over the government. Policy engineering. So what, is this, what does this mean in practice? We're seeing it happen right now. It means that whenever we confront problems that are different from the problems we've been, we, we solved yesterday, the government has trouble figuring out what to do. And it has trouble organizing effective purposeful action on new or novel problems. So if you think through the record of nonlinear crises and policy challenges over the last 30 years, really since the end of the Cold War, this is a bad record. Um, there are some pockets of outstanding performance here and there that are kind of notable to look at. But in general, what you see over and over again are problems of maladjustment, people not knowing what to do. Uh, by the way, the tendency to over-militarize problems and call in the military to work on things the military isn't really qualified to work on is actually a symptom of the disease. Um, as the military becomes, we more and more look at it as one of the few reliable public institutions we know we still have at the national level. And then we try to think of problems more and more in terms those institutions can solve, which generally they are uh, a lot of the problems we call on them to solve, including in Afghanistan and Iraq, for example, uh, they don't know how to solve either. Um, and so you see all sorts of pathologies. So now let me bring this um, back, say, to the present day, to the present crisis. Let me illustrate. Um, you could break down the crisis that we're in right now from a policy making point of view into it. Let's just, to keep it simple, let's just take off four dimensions. One is a diagnosis of the problem, detection and warning. Actually, the answer on that is the experts did reasonably well, and then you can criticize how well the politicians or policymakers paid attention to the experts. Because the detection and warning problem was fundamentally a problem of epidemiology. And the epidemiologists all recognized the problem right away. That was what they were used to. They were trained to that. And mainly, they were very quick to sound the alarm. And then we all know the stories of what ensued after that, or we're, we're beginning to get those stories. That's dimension one. Dimension two is finally they pay attention to the epidemiologists. They get the warning that there's a problem. Now they have to start crafting a policy response. And the first policy response they have to craft is the lockdown. The lockdown, by the way, if you think about it conceptually, is a relatively simple policy problem. Oh yeah, you have to work on how to define which workers are essential and so on. But it's not a super complex or difficult policy problem, the lockdown. And when folks said, well, let's just, you had to make the trade-offs as to whether you were going to do it. But there's actually designing and writing the order is not a super hard problem. All right. Now let's turn to dimension three, the economic adjustment and assistance to the catastrophe. This, of course, now this is a hard problem, very complex, which also calls on all sorts of administrative capabilities to li literally, how do you get money to affected businesses and employees, even if you want to, even if you appropriate it? And this, I think, if you look at this, this is already turning into a gigantic mess. Um, we hope that if we, <laughs> if, if you flood the country with trillions of dollars, some significant quotient of it will get into the right hands that need it. But as a policy program, it's displaying many weaknesses in design. And mostly this program and all these remedies are being designed working around the executive branch. The executive branch is relatively inert. It's noisy and inert, <laughs> by and large. 
So most of the economic adjustment work is being done at state and local levels by the Federal Reserve Board and by the Congress um, and committee staffers who mostly work around the executive branch because it's inert. The fourth dimension, which we're just coming into right now, is how do you do the transition to mitigation? All of you have been looking at this, I'm sure. And all of you know that the transition to mitigation has some ready common principles, which Gottlieb and others have been writing about, and Ezekiel Emanuel and um, Harvey Feinberg and other good people. And the basic principles in the transition to mitigation are relatively clear some sort of benchmarks for when to make the transition that you need to define. You need to uh, have some sort of testing program or safety program for who can go back to doing what where that you then have to run and administer. Um, you have to have some sort of contact tracing or isolation policy based on what you find. And then you have to kind of make decisions about what can get reopened when and how. And one could go on. This is actually a very complex policy problem. And you can see that our government is simply floundering in even uh, charting the basic steps to do it. The, the, the abstract principles of the transition to mitigation are not super hard. They're somewhat hard, but they're not super hard. But the actual design of the policy to implement those principles is actually highly complex once you get into it. Uh, just if I was to pick just one illustration, suppose you have a certain number of tests and you have to decide who gets tested first, what tests do they get, how do you credentialize that they have had the tests, and what is the significance of different test results? For instance, there's one significance that you haven't had the disease, there's another significance if you demonstrate serological immunity, if serological immunity really confers immunity, which by the way is also disputed. So this, my only point is the transition to mitigation is a highly complex policy problem. And you see our government is not getting off to a flying start and work on it, shall I say. And probably we're just going to watch really hard and start imitating and copying what people like the Austrians are figuring out. So I'm going to uh, wind this introduction up for a moment because just step back and say, I'm making a macro point, which is that in general, America used to be really good at policymaking and competence, famously good. Now it's famously bad. We ought to notice that and analyze it, and I have some theories. <laughs> then the second is to notice this in the micro application right now, is the current crisis we're in is offering us a vivid demonstration of the shortcomings of our policy competence, especially when we get beyond uh, routine capabilities, and when we get, frankly, beyond the state and local levels that all that tend to have the most experience and concrete problem solving ability. And I'll stop there as a way of introducing. I haven't come, Jeffrey, to your questions about um, investigations and commission reports and all of that, but I thought I would just lay those initial controversial arguments down on the table for you. Hey, Philip, thank you. That, that was splendid and a great way to get us started. Danielle, are you still there? Yes, absolutely. So I think it's going to be more efficient if you uh, call on people, because frankly, I don't see everybody all the time, and I think it'll be cleaner and more effective. And I'm reminding people, please, when you speak, ask a question, share a comment, identify yourself, and that helps us on the call. And then as we use this material going forward, Danielle, who do we have first? Well, first up, we have Aaron Sibarium, and just to note for everyone, um, feel free to either raise your hand using the um, the raise hand button in the in the Zoom um, chat with me in the chat, or just wave at me, um, and I'll and I'll do my best to catch you all. But Aaron, go ahead. Hi, Philip. Um, I'm Aaron. I'm the assistant editor here at the American Interest. Uh, apologies that you can't see me. My bandwidth is really bad. Um, my question is.
more of an idea. I just kind of want to bounce off you and hear your reaction. It, on the history you just gave, it seems like there's a bit of a, a paradox or irony, which is that America used to have this high degree of technocratic competence and efficiency. Then, you know, in the 90s, I think it would be fair to say that elite culture um, and elite institutions came to prioritize technocratic competence much more than I think they had in the 50s and much more explicitly the stereotype of the organization kid that David Brooks and others have talked about is sort of values neutral technocrat became the ideal at places like Harvard and Yale. And yet it was about, as that became the ideal, technocratic confidence stagnated or reversed. So I guess my question is, is there sort of a paradox here where the foundations of technocratic efficiency, whatever they are, in some sense almost depended on technocratic efficiency and policy competence not being the highest value uh, that we instilled in our elites. What do you think of that? Um, I really don't know. I'll leave to others to judge what values we were instilling in our elites in the 1980s and 90s. Um, I would argue to you that the actual ability to get things done and solve problems in the world was actually not the premium value that was instilled in our elites. Um, and it is mainly not the way our elites were trained. Our elites were not trained in how to actually solve practical problems in the public domain. That's not what the social scientists taught either in economics or in political science. Um, I have a separate criticism of what happened when the public policy schools were created in the 70s and 80s. I used to help chair part of the core curriculum of the Harvard Kennedy School through much of the 1990s and saw firsthand what was happening there. And I think the public policy schools have substantially and empirically failed in uh, training people who are gifted at policy work. And a lot of people who teach in the policy schools know this, um, including some former deans of policy schools who've joined in a manifesto that I helped author that has hundreds of signatories from around the world decrying the collapse of education and public problem solving. So I'm not sure the elites actually valued the ability to do practical problem solving. I think the problem gets progressively worse even before the 1990s, because what happened was we had all this knowledge of the how to do this stuff well, but since the knowledge never migrated back to academia, it was all oral knowledge, as if the people who were policy craftsmen were like medieval craftsmen who knew how to stain glass in a certain way, and they passed it along through oral apprenticeship and imitation of others. And eventually, over a generation or so, the oral transmission lines become attenuated and break down and disappear entirely. And the culture and knowledge of how to perform that medieval craft is lost. And that's my observation as to actually what happened. And you, the decay is already becoming visible in the 1980s. By the 1990s, it's, it's, the decay has become general. And you see the breakdowns too in various organizational cultures. You see it in the cultures of how written staff work is done. I'm a big connoisseur of written staff work. Uh, this is partly having to do with the way I was trained, both in law and government. And you see the quality of the written staff work deteriorate. You see the quality of the work simply disappear and how people record what work has been done at meetings and so on. And it's already bad during the 1990s. I saw this personally when we did the 9-11 Commission work and asked to see all the records of the policy work that had been done. And we had complete access. And <laughs> it's a pretty bad story in both the Clinton and the Bush administrations, actually. And, from, and it actually doesn't get better from there. I mean, any of you who worked on the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war will uh, firsthand as I did and others I think on this call, um, it, that some of those catastrophes make the errors of the 1990s 
um, look uh, childlike by comparison. And then here we are now with this episode in which I don't think uh, the federal government is covering itself with glory, shall we say. Philip, thank you. Um, Danielle is communicating uh, with me in a very efficient manner. And as I see the list, let, let me suggest we try two at a time. If it doesn't work, we'll go back to one at a time, just in the, say, in the spirit of trying to include more people and points of view. So Walt, Hudson, and Giselle, and we'll take you two together. And then after Philip has had a chance to reply, we'll take Martin and Charles. Hey, uh, good morning, folks. This is Walt Hudson. I, I am a professor <clears throat> at National Defense University at the Eisenhower School. I, Hi, Walt. Hey, good to see you, Dr. Zelko. Uh, and uh, we've had the privilege of, of Dr. Zelko coming uh, to our, our school. Uh, we're hopefully going to see him next year, and we've used your article with great profit, and we're, I'm going to personally use it in my policy entrepreneurship class. So having said all that, um, so um, let me posit one question. Do you think, given your article, you talk about hardware and software and, and the need to have competence in both. And let me use that metaphor. It, it strikes me as potentially possible that the architecture that was established in the late 40s with the National Security Act and then sort of reaching its ap ap apotheosis with the Goldwater Nichols in the late 80s, where you essentially securitized to a great degree our foreign policy to the extent where military commanders of COCOMs were virtual viceroys. And, and on the one hand and on the other hand, by the 1990s, you have even progressive elites using the military as an instrument of first resort, a famous quote from Secretary of State um, uh, name escapes you right now, but saying, what's the use of this great military if you're not going to use it? Yes, that would be Madeleine Albright. Madeleine Albright, yeah, sorry for that, that brain, uh, brain gap. Ha do we need to relook that architecture in order to sort of recalibrate our government so the military isn't necessarily the go-to instrument, and by rebalancing it, would we therefore help to restore some competency or at least perceive competency in other areas of government. Hey, hey Walt, this is Jeff here. Th thank you for that. Um, Giselle, um, I I I'm having second thoughts. <laughs> does your comment take us in a completely different direction? If it does, I sus suspect we ought to pause. If it's somehow related, please join in. Giselle, you need to, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be patient. Okay, so then over to you, Philip. And I will try to keep my answer shorter to give more people a chance to ask questions. So to answer Walter's question briefly, first, what the hardware software thing he's talking about? By hardware, I mean the structures and tools available for useful work, which is mostly the way we think about government as structures and processes. And mostly we think government is breaking down because the hardware is bad, the, the, the structures and tools. My argument is that the software is more important. Software dictates how the work is done within the available structures and tools. And I'm focusing attention as the software as being a key variable, not the hardware. Um, Walt is asking whether by changing the structures surrounding, say, the national security system and the National Security Act, we can do a little bit more to shift the country away from its over-reliance on military institutions to solve these public problems. And my answer, sadly, is I think the answer is no. I don't, th I don't think that's the answer. Uh, I think we're turning to the military institutions because they have a reputation for competence, at least at some things. And it's, uh, it's not so much a structure of the uh, National Security Act's institutions. Oddly, the National Security Act 
was intended to compromise the civilian and military uh, balance of power. It was meant to bring the military into foreign policy making, but also to make sure that we had national policy making that included all the instruments of national power, somewhat modeled on the British War Cabinet, whose work we had admired during World War II. So uh, the military wanted to have some voice in foreign policy making, but the civilians wanted to get industry and wider natural, national resources involved in national security work. This is a context now that's hard to remember. Um, but I think that tinkering with that act is not going to change the underlying reliance on what people think are working institutions and the tendency to over militarize problems to lean on the legacy institutions that we've over invested in and trust so much. You've, that's not the way I think you rebuild trust in uh, civilian policy work. And actually the military's policy work is quite uneven depending on the problem. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Philip. So we have Giselle and then after Giselle and Philip replies in the next round, Martin and Charles. Giselle, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Phil, for the presentation. That's uh, I'm very sympathetic to the ideas you advance. I, by the way, I work at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, so I have not a two-part question, but a one-and-a-half-part question. Uh, the large question is whether it's really possible to disaggregate process from purpose in these things. Um, at least from my perspective, one thing that really seems to have atrophied through the generations, but especially since the end of the Cold War, is the ability to think sort of long-term and with genuine strategic perspective. But as you look back at sort of the second Cold War generation, the, the, the uh, bureaucrats, if you will, don't use that term pejoratively, but the people who ran the world um, in the 70s and 80s, they inherited a strategic framework uh, from the, the post-World War II generation. And since, again, we've sort of lost that structure, things have really gone off the rails. And then I would say that has also exacerbated a problem that as a student of military affairs um, uh, is, is very striking to me. There's a famous book called America's First Battles, uh, which sort of repeats or you know catalogs uh, how bad we are at responding to an unpredicted crisis or a new set of circumstances. And so we sort of flounder about until we learn from stealing other people's best practices or failing on our own, et cetera, et cetera. And I think absent the larger framework to put things in, we've, what we've seen, especially since 9-11, is sort of a repeat of the first battle experience. And now we're sort of having a similar one again and because there is no continuity either of people or purpose, um, we're going to get, I think, sort of uh, enmeshed in this sort of react to the crisis of the moment. And then when the immediate crisis passed, sort of go back to um, uh, the situation that got us in trouble in the first place. Uh, so while it's necessary to uh, restore confidence in policy making, it would be a good idea if we had um, an azimuth to set our policy uh, to point our, uh, you know, newly uh, invigorated and professional um, policy making operat towards. Yeah. Um, yes, of course, it would be good to have a steady azimuth of direction on which we could plan. Uh, the world is, is rarely so accommodating. The, uh, the first battle problem, and I know the book you're, mentioned, you're referring to, is actually kind of an interesting story. So let's take um, two episodes in which uh, the United States famously did not do well during the mid 20th century, the outbreak of the Korean War and the uh, war in Vietnam. Um, the outbreak of the Korean War um, didn't catch us unprepared because um, we we because we were uh, not willing to prepare. It wasn't because of the absence of an azimuth. 
we actually had set the azimuth. We'd set it very deliberately. We had decided very carefully, very deliberately, and in writing that we were not going to fight that war. And then when the war hit us, we changed our mind. And therefore, we were unprepared. Um, that's a different kind of problem. And then once we decided to get prepared, and then we made some other mistakes in the process of the campaign. And then we reacted galvanically as we prepared for World War III by the end of 1950. But that was a different kind of problem. We actually had a clear azimuth, a very good planning process. We just changed our minds and surprised Stalin, by the way. The, the Vietnam problem is, is a fascinating and tragic problem precisely actually because the quality of the policy thinking in some ways was so good. That is, anyone who reads the Pentagon Papers, what's striking about the Pentagon Papers is the quality of the staff work and the appreciation of the dilemmas is remarkably high. They see all the dilemmas. They're simply tortured as to what to do about them. And then they end up making a series of bad decisions for reasons that historians still debate. But it's not that, uh, unlike what some people said, that we blundered unknowingly into Vietnam, we got into Vietnam with unusually high quality understanding of all the dilemmas and trade-offs and problems in what we were undertaking, which is why the disclosure and release of the Pentagon Papers was so sensational. The documents were so incredibly self-revealing about how well we understood what we were getting into that their disclosure then was such a shock to the American people. Um, the, that's, but that's a very different story, say, from the Iraq War story or the Afghanistan story. Um, there's an interesting contrast in the post 9-11, the, uh, the post 9-11 on the domestic side in, in late 2001 was actually handled with great skill and mostly no one has ever heard anything about it. There was an excellent book about this written by a journalist named Stephen Brill called After. And a lot of this effort was organized and run by a White House staffer named Josh Bolton, whom some of you have heard of. But it was mainly on the domestic side and it was actually handled with great skill and therefore it's virtually unknown. Then through 2002, we start making every pathological mistake that it's possible to make in some of these extended foreign and defense reactions to 9-11. But it's easy to forget actually some of the pockets of excellence in the response because the, uh, the failures that occurred later on are so gigantic. So I have Martin and Charles, and we'll find out in a moment whether they belong together or we separate them. Martin? <clears throat> yeah, hi. Um, this is all quite fascinating to me, actually, because uh, I've uh, inhabited various Hey, Martin, save for the group, but also for those who listen to this later, who you are and what you do. Yeah, that, sorry, that's uh, what I was about to say. Uh, I uh, just got done managing uh, Bill Weld's presidential campaign. Um, I'm an academic. I study great power competition. I'm working on a couple of pieces uh, on uh, the geopolitics of COVID. Um, I've also been on the Hill uh, and in the Defense Department. Uh, and I come from a family of engineers. So all of this is kind of um, uh, highly relevant, actually. Um, so I guess I had a couple of observations. And I was wondering if you might have some thoughts about this. Um, the first, you, you've drawn kind of a, a, a uh, distinction, I suppose, uh, with regard to COVID, and I think we could talk about this in other areas, uh, between sort of the um, what the British would call the civil service or what might be called the technocracy and then kind of the political level of decision making. Um, and if you think about that, um, if you sort of uh, look at both of those levels, uh, it's really, uh, I, I would say, the big decisions in the last 20 years where the embarrassments have happened. Uh, like you say, the, um, the response to COVID was excellent at the uh, kind of expert level. It, it just got worse and worse higher up the chain you went. So I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about the fact that the big variable here that is almost the elephant in the room is mass media culture, or the internet, or communications, or everything that has happened in the last 30-odd years. Um, 
with regard to essentially, in, in a lot of ways, the hyper responsiveness of government to its citizenry. It's a little bit difficult to put experts in charge or uh, lean heavily on them for detailed policies if those experts aren't heavily trusted by the voters or if their policies aren't popular with them. Um, and conversely, it's very easy to go on Twitter and say what's up, whatever's on your mind. And if you think about kind of the locuses, loci of uh, high level decision making, even apart from the president, you've really got the White House and probably the staff of the various um, House and Senate committees who tend to have at the very front of their mind, how do I get my boss reelected? Uh, in an era where everything is blasted all over the internet, the, inter the instant it's said. I wonder then how you produce that kind of policy expertise in, the, in an environment that's kind of hostile to it. Um, the second point I was going to make is that uh, with regard to technocratic expertise, if you think about the, the era in which supposedly uh, all of this was going quite well, we had just come out of World War II. We had kind of a consensus on uh, our national politics. Uh, American politics was relatively uh, stable and boring. Post 1960s, you have a right that is generally uh, skeptical of an awful lot of the post World War II state and a left that wants to considerably change it or augment it in some way. It's a little bit difficult to tinker with the engine of a car or to, to want to become an auto mechanic, perhaps, if you're morally opposed to cars. Uh, or if you uh, prefer to take buses and you uh, have no interest in them. So I was wondering, basically, if you could address what I think is the a key variable, which is interest in the kind of expertise you're describing, um, either by the uh, ideologues on the one hand or by the general public. Uh, so thank you. So I like Martin's comments very much. Let me, um, let me put this in very s simple terms. When there are really serious problems that are really dangerous, people then tend to value competence and expertise to help solve those problems. If you're really sick and you're in the hospital, you place a fairly high premium on expertise and competence of the people who are treating you. I think one outcome of this crisis, which is a healthy outcome, is there is going to be some push for people putting on caps that say, make America competent again. And there's going to be a little uh, uptick. Because see, in the Great Depression and World War II, people felt that those were really dangerous problems. And that creates a, uh, an environment in which people who can actually solve problems and can demonstrate that are really highly valued and problem solving cultures are highly valued. Frankly, since the 1980s, I think mainly America has been, uh, people have mostly felt remarkably safe and not terribly endangered. Well, we have our, we have our threat phantoms and our threat abstractions and occasionally on 9-11, we get these shocks to which we react. And I was part of all of that. But the default mode, if there's not a truly pressing problem, a truly dangerous problem, the default mode is just to go into culture wars. You see, mass politics is by and large primarily cultural. It's not a policy argument. These are cultural arguments about what values and attitudes leaders seem to represent and ongoing cultural clashes that are also clashes about identity and who you are and what values you and your group represent. That's our default mode unless we're diverted by something that's really serious. And I grew up in a period actually, the Cold War was not a period that was considered stable and boring by the people who were living through it. Um, I remember the Vietnam War when hundreds of American soldiers were being killed every week and we, the country was wracked by division and protest, double-digit inflation, and epidemic violent crime. 
I grew up actually and was trained to be a criminal lawyer in my in an earlier career. So in the in the 1970s, which was a very violent and disturbed time. So relatively speaking, the politics of recent years have been just the politics you've described, Martin, but these are the politics of in which culture wars reign supreme, not genuine arguments over how to solve extremely threatening and dangerous problems. Well, folks, we're in a different moment right now. And that moment is going to have some sort of impact on our culture. And hopefully it will be salutary. So, so Philip, Charles, if I may, I just want to add a quick follow up question. H how then, so project and speculate a little bit. H how does one sort and get the balance right and accommodate reality because it seems to me now to take one piece of this puzzle we have a president who i would argue entered office unqualified has shown himself as temperamentally unsuitable to the job and is not performing in this crisis with a high level of competence and yet at the same time as you just suggested there's the politics and there's a culture, and it's not unreasonable the thought that he will be reelected in the fall. Well, we don't know. We don't know what happens the next 90 days, but, but the two don't fit together. Why, why are we not having at least yet among Trump voters a turn, a recognition, an outcry? Gosh, we love your culture, but we need more. This isn't enough. I actually believe. Um some of that is happening. Um, an interesting illustration of this is a big story, I think, in, um, I think it's in the Wall Street Journal this morning about the uh, sports radio reporter in New York City, who is a very pro-Trump guy, but who's gotten really angry about what he sees happening in Queens, and who basically just gave the speech that Jeffrey is imagining people giving and did a rant on the radio that became viral. And the, I, so there is some of that happening. But the cultural allegiances and the culture war definition of these issues is very strong. And indeed, you saw people kept trying to interpret the crisis through a culture war lens. Like, this is pointy headed elites trying to foist a fake crisis on us. And then they're, oh, it's a real crisis. But then you'll try to turn it into a culture war crisis by turning it into an issue of, well, who can we blame? And uh, which bad cultural force can we blame for this crisis? Uh, this bad foreigner, these bad foreigners, um, et cetera. And then so you can turn it into the political issue you're comfortable with because these folks are not these folks do reality TV politics and they're not comfortable with getting into public problem solving. And ultimately, um, I think uh, this, we are going through a sea change moment, depending on how long it lasts and how impacting the people feel this is. I believe there will be some higher profile that will, be, that will happen for politicians who seem competent at solving problems. Now, will that be an incremental change or will that be a sea change? Actually, all of you probably can guess at that better than I can. But that's going to be a, uh, that's going to be a crucial issue in the next few months. Thank you, Charles. And would you tell us who you are? Uh, yes, Charles Davidson, the co-founder and publisher of The American Interest. And thank you for your past contributions, uh, Phil, and it's a great honor to have you with us today. Um, I think uh, your proposal, uh, as laid out in this article last summer, is just fantastic. So I, I think we should get behind it. And I'm just wondering what traction you've gotten with these ideas so far and how, uh, how does one make this happen? Uh, a little bit, I mean, practically speaking, and also in terms of the current uh, political environment. So Charles has the advantage of some of you in that he's actually read my article and knows what I'm arguing for. And basically I'm arguing for a different kind of training in academia to prepare people for policy work. 
that's different from the kind of training we give now. And by the way, need not be a new standalone residential degree program. It ideally should be something that can clip on pretty flexibly to many subject matter specializations. And we have some interesting educational innovations that might allow us to prepare some new kind of program. I do think this education needs to give people deep experience in lifelike situations through quite immersive and detailed case studies that then allow them to work through the pro practical problems in you encounter and choices people have to make in operations and policy design. Now, how to change academia. Very hard. Uh, legacy. And, uh, I used to be a, a, the dean of the graduate school at the University of Virginia, so I understand how academic institutions work a little bit. Um, here's the good news. The good news is that there are a large number of other scholars and former officials who agree with this agenda and who have signed, more than 200 of them from around the world, a manifesto on education for public problem solving. In fact, if you Google manifesto education public problem solving, you'll come up with a website that's actually hosted at Stanford, where Frank Fukuyama and Jeremy Weinstein are among the ringleaders over there. Anne-Marie Slaughter is a ringleader over at Princeton. Jim Steinberg, who has been a dean of such schools at Syracuse in Texas, is also involved. Um, and uh, um, some other very good people who've worked in state and local government. Uh, so there's that movement. What we'll, you'll need is for this to get traction in some leading academic institutions who will then launch prototypes with some significant financial backing. And then actually, if they'll just launch prototypes and let people see the alternative educational model, I'm actually relatively confident that uh, a Darwinian process will ensue and in which um, healthy things will happen over, over time. Because I think uh, the bankruptcy of a lot of the current models and preparing people for problem solving are, is, is pretty evident to, to a large number of people. But you have, that's the problem you have on the education side. Also, if Oh. Damn. Uh, very, be very impactful and create a lot of attention. It won't happen in this particular presidential administration, but I can conceive the world in which it could happen. But you, the, the interesting, the story of like, how does big educational innovation happen? Like, suppose you were to look at the history of, gee, when did they invent the canonical curriculum of law schools? You know, with that standard first year law curriculum that I took, or say, when did they invent business schools and the canonical curriculum of business school or medical schools? When you get into it, these are actually extremely individual idiosyncratic little stories say about, oh, the, Har you know, the Harvard Law School in the 19 teens, 20s, and 30s, or the invention of a Harvard Business School early in the 20th century, and a handful of people who simply invented a core curriculum, which then kind of caught on, and then everybody had to imitate it. So you, you go back through the history of these things, you actually see that a relatively small number of people can make a difference. Okay, so, so uh, we have Nicole, Peter, and Mike, Mike Fox. And Nicole, tell us who you are. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole Penn. I'm the, the program manager for AEI Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies program. Um, and Wahua, I'm a UVA graduate. So uh, I, I wanted to ask a little bit more about this, um, the deficiencies, particularly since I have a lot of friends who went to UVA's public policy school, and so I have a, a good sense of what went on there. When I think historically about, you know, great leaders um, in American history, uh, you know, Washington, Grant, Eisenhower, the, the thing that these guys were trained with were um, they'll have real world experience in getting 
things from point A to point B. You know, Washington's a surveyor, um, Grant was a quartermaster, um, Eisenhower worked on the transcontinental army convoy, Lincoln was a prairie lawyer, and it seems like this, I mean, this, this is entirely missing from 21st century life. So there's a larger, there seems to be a larger problem with the fact that you, you just get a bunch of 21, 22 year olds, you, you shove them through a four year, and I love my time at UVA, don't get me wrong, you know, a, a four year party, a very educationally enriching party, and then you put them into a master's program, and then they get picked up in government, and there's no, none of that real world experience of actually getting something from point A to point B. So I wonder if there's any appetite, I mean, this seems to be a, a cry for a kind of overhaul of the entire post-secondary um, educational system of, of really, how could we reward programs that actually train people who, who are in a, um, a position where, they are, where, where they're learning, where they're working, um, rather than just reading case studies? Philip, you want to go ahead and take that? I think he might be frozen again. We'll, we'll see him unfrozen momentarily. So, so let's stand by, it'll either unglitch or he will um, depart and rejoin. All right, can you hear me now? We hear you, welcome back. Thank you. Um, it's, internet's great, but it's not perfect. The, uh, um, I was complimenting Nicole on the quality of her question um, and saying that, that the practical experience point's very powerful and very right. I remember Sandra Day O'Connor used to bemoan the fact that more judges and justices didn't have a lot of real world experience, including experience as elected politicians. Um, I'll simply comment, I, I was a career foreign service officer for a number of years. I was a trial and appellate lawyer. And by the way, I have actually run for and been elected to office. I was an elected member of a local school board in a town I lived in, um, in Massachusetts, where being on the local school board actually matters a lot. And people know who you are. So I find that very helpful. And I, so I agree completely with your point. I'll say, by the way, that in business school, the best business schools increasingly are putting a premium on people who have worked after they went to college before they apply. So you actually have a leg up on other applicants for good business schools if you already have worked in a private business before you come to business school, which is uh, interesting and healthy. The public policy school point you raise is, of course, right. It was my experience, actually, that the people like me who went into schools like that, who already had a lot of practical experience, would then, frankly, try to bypass a lot of the core curriculum and would almost design their own curriculum to cannibalize it into taking things that they knew they could use uh, because the core curriculum actually was a nuisance and wasn't all that helpful which is uh, smart people who are adapting to the dysfunctional system they're in. And that, there are stories like that too. Uh, but we can uh, try to change that and make it better. And I think you're in a, in a good functioning world, the practical experience would then be leavened with getting practical training at some point when you can need it. One of the problems is most people who find themselves, many people who find themselves in policy jobs weren't trained to do policy because they've been in a subject matter specialization. Let's say like I've been a doctor in a hospital, but all of a sudden I'm put in a big public health capacity. 
it's not like after, and I'm 10 years in, it's not like at that point I can move my family and go back to school for two years. So you need some educational program that can reach those people where they are. When that Lieutenant Colonel who's been trained as to how to fly or, 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 or repair aircraft suddenly finds themselves in a much broader position, the military will sometimes send those people back to school and pay for that. But um, not every institution um, indulges that luxury. Peter, we're on to you and introduce yourself, please. Hi, great. Uh, Peter Rao from the Hudson Institute, where I work on U.S. foreign policy with a focus on Europe. Um, and thanks to the American Interest for having me. Thanks, Jeff, for the invitation. I have a question um, for Phil Zellico that is maybe not one that you signed up for, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because you're an astute observer of Washington and a veteran of government, as you just mentioned. And that is, uh, I'm of the 9-11 generation, and there were enormous changes to American government after 9-11, I think, to the consolidation of agencies into the Department of Homeland Security, which was stood up, uh, the passage of new laws like the Patriot Act to take on some of these challenges, the breaking down of the CIA, FBI silo, the standing up of a DNI, um, and uh, the expansion of, of surveillance, which might be particularly useful as a case study for this uh, crisis with the Warrantless Surveillance Act, among other things. So um, my question to you is, do you want to take a first stab at um, uh, how our institutions might need to be retooled, if at all? I know the CDC has come in for some criticism. I suppose this is a little bit different in that it's uh, an immediate medical public health a dimension, a state and local, um, state and local challenge, just like say Hurricane Katrina, and and the federal government has a reinforcing role. But you know, there's more than just the public health immediate kind of uh, local uh, dimension to this. So a any way you want to tackle that, or anything you'd like to say, I'd just be curious as to your thoughts about that. Sure, um, I can. Uh, let me use as an example, actually, uh, one of the post 9/11 innovations that's not very well known. Um, the DNI thing is famous, but the DNI thing was a long-standing agenda, actually going back to the early 1960s, that then the 9-11 episode helped propel forward again. And the actual shape of that ended up getting determined a lot more by Congress than by the 9-11 Commission. But the uh, one really remarkable institutional innovation after 9-11 was something called the National Counterterrorism Center or NCTC for short. And in general, this has been regarded as a successful innovation. So the NCTC is basically designed to do two things. It's designed to, to bring together all information relevant to warning and assessment in one spot with analysts from various disciplines and all kinds of sources of information to pool information to do a better job of assessment and warning and of analysis of the enemy groups. Uh, it was actually partly modeled, frankly, on M the way MI5 does things, but I didn't say that at the time because uh, it would have alarmed people. Um, it's, and by the way, to break down the domestic foreign barrier and analyze this transnationally, not in rigid domestic foreign categories. It, it did that fairly well. And you can very quickly think of analogies to that in the public health space that would similarly pool information more effectively from all sources uh, and various disciplines, including the epidemiologists and the public health folks, but also with others uh, who might get other insights that are not being made publicly available or available to the WHO. The other thing the NCTC did is it tried to do more coordination of operations across uh, agency boundaries. For example, if CIA spots uh, a terrorist in Bangkok, who, by the way, might have a visa to enter the United States, somebody's got to hand that off to immigration authorities and tell them to be on the lookout for a person with this name who might be attempting to enter the United States because they have a visa in their passport. By the way, that didn't happen in the pre 9 11 case, because in a way, the chief of station in Bangkok didn't think that was his job and, and, and so on. Um, but you can think of analogies to that in the healthcare space too. Right now, we're going through really quite interesting and difficult problems of coordination 
hospital bed space, ICU capabilities, ventilators, also in the transition like testing equipment, swabs, use of the federal stockpile, all of those things, which by the way, your epidemiologist isn't necessarily trained to do. And you think, hmm, gee, uh, institutionally, are we well organized to bring together the different kinds of skill sets we need in order to figure out who should be prioritized for testing in a mitigation transmission, a mitigation transition? You see what I mean? And then if I, if, you, if I ask you to sit down and kind of map out kind of what entity you wish would exist to work that, to work those transition issues that could take into account, gee, uh, how many people do local health departments actually have available to do contact tracing? Uh, what capabilities do they actually have to isolate people who test positive? And pulled some of that together you might imagine a different institution than some of the institutions we're trying to invent ad hoc right now. We have Mike Fox. Great. Um, my name is Mike Fox. I work for J Street, a pro-peace, pro-Israel, pro-diplomacy advocacy organization. Um, my question um, has to do with really the privatization of government and the growth of the consultantocracy that um, has come under a lot of criticism recently. And um, I guess my question is, you know, we talk about having some kind of work experience before coming into government or um, insight into moving things and processes, but how do we prioritize those skills with but at the same time avoiding uh, the McKinseyfication of our entire government that, you know, I think a lot of people have been criticizing recently, whether it's um, the, uh, whether it's Jared Kushner thinking a suite of McKinsey expert friends of his can figure out any problem or um, some criticism that Pete Buttigieg encountered from the left for his um, uh, McKinsey background. And then, so that's one aspect of the question, which is how do we prevent a bunch of people with one set of skills thinking they can fix everything? The other question is how much has the um, privatization of the civil service hurt us? Um, I think some of the younger people on this call may be familiar that a lot of entry points into government agencies come through consulting firms and contractors with names that no one's ever heard of who do everything from manage um, uh, law enforcement development programs in Central America to um, serve as schedulers and secretaries at the Department of Energy. And right. I understand a lot of that was a cost saving mechanism, but what have we lost? Um, Actually, in my view, it's not a cost-saving mechanism. Um, it's, I've, I've witnessed a lot of this firsthand. Uh, anybody who worked in, in the wars, um, the recent wars, has seen a lot of this firsthand. Um, and he, here's what happens when you, when you contract out the substantive work, you contract out the substantive expertise about how to do the work. You've been basically then taken the expertise in how to do the work, the policymaking expertise, you've taken it out of the government. The government now has lost the policymaking capability. The private contractors, by the way, don't necessarily have it either. That's a, I, that's a, I can illustrate that story in depth. Um, what the government then retains is expertise in contracting. But that's not the substantive expertise in how to actually make the policies of what to do. So I, I'm s s sorry to say I've seen really ugly examples of this very close up, including on the front lines in the field. And uh, the results are very costly. And a lot of people have been killed as a result of some of these things. So then, uh, then you may say, ah, but I can't keep in government the full scale of effort that I need in a crisis. 
That's correct. So now here's your problem. I need to keep the key expert policy making expertise inside the government. Yet I can't keep the full staffing that I'll need in a crisis employed full time in the government at all times. Correct. Therefore, what you need is you need to keep the core expertise in the government and create a surge capability, probably through some kind of reserve force that you build up, train, and prepare. There are actually various proposals to do this, including, by the way, medical reserve forces that are being invented right now ad hoc, as you see in England, and are being proposed in the United States, um, which actually can be uh, developed in cadre form in peacetime, and which you maintain your core policymaking expertise, you exercise capabilities, and by the way, you develop, as the military has learned, people all over America who take an interest in some of these policy issues, which, by the way, helps you in your domestic politics. So, so here's what I'd like to do. We're, we're, we're just about out of time. I, I want to call on one person who has not yet had it. Well, a number of you haven't spoken. Apologies. But, but Jonathan, to you, with a last question or comment, you've not been in the conversation thus far. You need to unmute, John. Working on that. Am I here? You're there. Um, thank you for this this fascinating session, and I'll take the liberty, Dr. Zelico, saying hello on behalf of our mutual friend Nick Mortensen, who is unfortunately having to job hunt in this market, something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. So I've just got to bring, sorry, I'm shallow. I have to bring Trump into the conversation. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm Jonathan Rausch. I'm a senior fellow at Brookings. Um, I write a lot about government and why it does and doesn't work. Um, so let's stipulate that there was some very substantial quotient of institutional decline and problem solving capacity prior to January of 2017. And let's all stipulate that there's probably been some additional quotient of decline in this administration because of its chaotic and highly politicized and highly personalized style. When you look at today's crisis, how do you allocate the, the, quot the quotas of, of decline as between those two things? And the, the honest answer, John, is um, I'll give you the answer I try to train my students to be ready to give. It goes like this. Quote, I don't know. I haven't done the analysis, close quote. I wish I could train more people to utter those words. But therefore, I have to occasionally be willing to utter them myself. Um, I, I'm on the outside right now of the policy processes. And so uh, to honestly, I have, a, I, you know, I have a visceral sense of what I can see from the outside and I have guesses, but I've learned enough over the years that these guesses are sometimes not right. And so uh, I agree with your supposition that there's a quotient in both camps. And I simply feel unqualified right now to figure out how to do the waiting. By the way, I do also notice there were some, um, the federal problems were compounded by some problems, for instance, in state and local government in New York. So, um, <clears throat> thank you. We're, we're 11.45 right on the dot. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for your time and participation. Uh, as I've learned, everybody is busy with a thousand Zoom conversations these days. <laughs> No one has a shortage of things to do and conversations to join. So, so thank you all for that. F Philip, thank you for a, a splendid uh, presentation and discussion and Q&A. And, and what I'd like to propose, not catching you off guard, but, but I'm being selfish here. Um, let's learn more and uh, find out more about how this plays out, the current public health crisis and the economic challenges that we are facing. And could we have you back at a date to be determined? I, I think we might be maybe a little smarter in 30 days to talk that, about that other piece of the conversation of how we
more fully, more rigorously self-critique how we've done at the federal and state level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because I think there will be a conversation. We do need a system and approach and what you're doing will play an important role I suspect this fall and this winter. Does that sound like an okay proposal? Uh, it's it's okay, and indeed, having listened to me for this long, for you to make that offer is the nicest thing you could have said. Well, well, you're generous. So, Philip, have a great day. Thanks for your time, and then everybody, uh, all the best, and we'll be with you soon. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Man. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.